Hi everyone. I thought I'd make this audio book because this can, can be a, a little bit long to read, but um, I'll try to help you get through it. I'll add some commentary to help you understand. Now, this is a romantic piece, The Deer Slayer, and it came in a very long, let me italicize that, a very long um, series called The Leather Stocking Tales. And these were all based on colonial life, frontier life um, in America. And it spanned the life of Natty Bumpo, who was half white, half Indian. And he moved um, throughout the wilderness of America until his death. Um, and he actually died in an earlier book, which is kind of weird. And then the deer slayer came later and they were showing how he was um, as a young man. So um, in this particular chapter, Natty Bumpo has um, faced another Huron warrior in a duel and um, he killed the man for the, and it was the first time he had ever killed someone. Um, and his fallen foe called him Deerslayer. So, um, but they're later going to give him the name Hawkeye, but that's um, a little ways off. So anyway, um, Natty has already sworn to be single for his entire life. Um, he believed that he was supposed to live single, to live in the wilderness, to follow the wilderness, and to um, basically be a bridge between the Native Americans and the whites. Okay, so this is from chapter 27 of The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper. I had an audio book on here, but I think I'm going to do my own because uh, this guy reads a little slow. But anyway. Um, okay, so from chapter 27, let me, why did this picture get down all the way down there? Okay. Because this is weird. Give me one second. There we go. All right. So this is from chapter 27 of The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper. It was an imposing scene into which Deer Slayer now found himself advancing. All the older warriors were seated on the trunk of a fallen tree, waiting his approach with grave decorum. On the right stood the young men, armed, while left was occupied by the women and children. In the center was an open space of considerable extent, always canopied by trees, but from which, which the underbrush, dead wood, and other obstacles had been carefully removed. The more open area had probably been much much used by former parties, for this was the place where the appearance of a sward was the most decided. The arches of the woods, even at high noon, cast their somber shadows on the spot, which the brilliant rays of the sun that struggled through the leaves contributed to mellow, and, if such an expression can be used, to illuminate. It was probably from a similar scene that the mind of man first got first got its idea of the effects of Gothic tracery and churchly use, this temple of nature producing some such effect so far as light and shadow were concerned. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is romanticism right here. Um, so nature is where man got his first view of I don't want to say view, his first insights, for lack of a better word, into religion. So this is a very religious kind of scene. And this is something that the romantics really valued was this the image of nature. Okay. As was not unusual among the tribes and wandering bands of the Aborigines, two chiefs shared, in nearly equal degrees, the principal and primitive authority that was wielded over these children of the forest. There were several who might claim the distinction of being chief men, but the two in question were so much superior to all the rest in influence that when they agreed, no one disputed their mandates, and when they were divided, the band hesitated like men who had lost their governing principles of action. It was also in conformity with practice, perhaps, we might add in conformity with nature, that one of the chiefs was indebted to his mind for his influence, whereas the other owed his distinction altogether to qualities that were physical. One was a senior, 
well known for eloquence in debate, wisdom in counsel, and prudence in measures, while his great competitor, if not his rival, was a brave distinguished was a brave distinguished in war, notorious for ferocity and remarkable in the way of the, of intellect, for nothing but the cunning and expedience of the war path. The first was Rivenoak, who had already been introduced to the reader, while the last was called Lepanther, in the language of the Canadas, of, or the Panther, to resort to the vernacular of the English colonies. The appellation of the fighting chief was supposed to indicate the qualities of the warrior, agreeably to a practice of the red man's nom nomenclature. Ferocity, cunning, and treachery, treachery being perhaps the distinctive features of his character. The title had been received from the French and was prized so much the more from that circumstance, the Indian submitting pro profoundly to the greater intelligence of his pale-faced allies in most things of this nature. How well the sobriquet was merited will be seen in the sequel. So, okay, we have two chiefs. One was older. One was in the same, the older man was known for eloquence and debate, so he could speak well. He was wise in counsel. He was prudent in measures, meaning he used good judgment. His competitor was a brave distinguished in war. So we've got one, the older one, who's very knowledgeable, uses his brain. Well, we have the second one who was very who used his brawn. He was a warrior. Okay. And these are the, these two chiefs. Riven Oak was the older one, the one who uses his brain. And the Panther is the one who is the good fighter. Okay. Riven Oak and Panther sat side by side awaiting the approach of their prisoner as Deerslayer put his moccasin foot on the strand. Nor did either move or utter a syllable until the young man had advanced into the center of the area and proclaimed his presence with his voice. This was done firmly, though in the simple manner that marked the character of the individual. Here I am, Mingos, he said, in the dialect of the Delawares, a language that most present understood. Here I am, and there is the sun. One is not more true to the laws of nature than the other has proved true to his word. I am your prisoner. Do with me what you please. My business with man and earth is settled. Nothing remains now but to meet the white man's God according to a white man's duties and gifts. So here is Deerslayer, Natty Bumpo, who's just come into um, the Hurons. Now the Hurons, if you do some research, they were very warlike people. They were always in skirmishes, always fighting for land. And then we have Natty Bumpo, who had been captured because he had been in that duel with the man, but he was let go to go take a message to an Indian tribe. And they told him to be back, to be back by a certain time. And um, if you knew that you were gonna be tortured and killed by Native Americans, would you come back? I'm not sure I would, but here's what Deerslayer believes. He knows that they can torture and kill him, but he also knows that once he returns, he has kept his word, so it's an honorable thing to do, but now he's free to escape. And if he escapes, then he's not deemed to be a coward like he would have been if he hadn't come. Does that make sense? Different way of thinking than what we have now. A murmur of approbation escaped even the women at this um, address. And for an instant, there was a strong and pretty general desire to adopt into the tribe one who owned so brave a spirit. Still, there were dissenters from this wish, among the principal of whom might be classed the panther, and his sister, Lusumac, who so called from the number of her children, who was the widow of Le, Le Loup Servier, now, now known to have fallen by the hand of the captive. That's the one that Natty Bumpo killed. So, Lusumac is the panther's sister. She, she was married to Le Loup Servier, and that's the one that, that Natty Bumpo killed. So he's left Le Sumac a widow with all these children. Native ferocity held one in subjection while the other, while the corroding passion of revenge prevented the other from admitting any gentler feeling at the moment. Not so with Rivenoak. The chief arose, stretched his arm before him in a gesture of courtesy, and paid his compliments with an ease and dignity that a prince might have envied. As in that band, his wisdom and eloquence were confessedly without rivals. 
He knew that on himself would properly fall the duty of first replying to the speech of the pale face. Pale face, you are honest, said the Huron orator. My people are happy in having captured a man and not a skulking fox. We now know you. We shall treat you like a brave. If you have once, if you have slain one of our warriors and helped to kill others, you have a life of your own ready to give away in return. Some of my young men thought that the blood of a pale face was too thin, that it would not, that it would refuse to run under the Huron knife. You will show them that this, it is not so. Your heart is stout as well as your body. It is a pleasure to make such a prisoner. Should my warrior say that the death of the Loup Servier ought not to be forgotten, and that he cannot travel towards the land of the spirits alone, that his enemy must be sent to overtake him, they will remember that he fell by the hand of a brave, and send you after him with such signs of our friendship, and shall not make him ashamed to keep your company. I have spoken. You know what I have said. So, Rivenoak is really impressed that Natty Bumpo has come back. He didn't think that he would. He thought he would be a coward, but Natty Bumpo did. So now it's up to the tribe. Are they going to send Le Loup Servier to the afterworld by himself? Or are they going to demand that Natty Bumpo, the deer slayer, go with Le Loup Servier? That's the question. So at this point, Natty Bumpo has no idea whether they're going to kill him or let him live. True enough, Mingo. All true is the gospel, returned the simple-minded hunter, Natty Bumpo. You have spoken, and I do not know, and I do not do know not only what you have said, but what is still more important what you mean. I dare to say your warrior, the lynx, was a stout-hearted brave and worthy of your friendship and respect, but I do not feel unworthy to keep his company without any passport from your hands. Nevertheless, here I am, ready to receive judgment from your counsel, if indeed the matter was not determined among you afore I got back. My old man would not send counsel over Paleface until they saw him among them, answered Rivenoak, looking around him a little ironically. They said it would be like sitting in counsel over the winds. They go where they will and come back as they see fit and not likewise. There was one voice that spoke in your favor, dear slayer, but it was alone like the song of the wren whose mate has been struck by the hawk. I think that I thank that voice, whosoever it may have been, Mingo, and will say it was as true a voice as the rest were lying voices. A furlough is as binding on a pale face, if he be honest, as it is on a redskin. And was it not so? I would never bring disgrace on the Delawares, among whom I may be said to have received my ed education. But words are useless and lead to bragging feelings. Here I am. Act your will on me. Rivenoak made a sign of acquiescence, and then a short conference was privately held among the chiefs. As soon as the latter ended, three or four young men fell back from among the armed group and disappeared. Then it was signified to the prisoner that he was at liberty to go at large on the point until a council was held concerning his fate. There was more of seeming than of real confidence, however, in this apparent liberality, inasmuch as the young men mentioned there already formed a line of sentinels across the breadth of the point inland, and escape from any other point part was out of the question. So they're telling Natty Bumpo to go away from the meeting while they counsel. And it should be a time where he could run away, but there's a line of sentinels and there's no easy escape route otherwise. Even the canoe was removed beyond this line of sentinels to a spot where it was considered safe from any sudden attempt. These precautions did not proceed from a failure of confidence, but from the conditions of his parole, and it would have been considered a commendable and honorable exploit to escape from his foes. So nice indeed were the distinctions drawn by the savages in cases of this nature that they often gave their victims a chance to evade the torture, deeming it as credible to the captors to overtake or to outwit a fugitive when his exertions were supposed to be quickened by the extreme jeopardy of his situation as it was for him to get clear from so much extraordinary vigilance. Nor was Deerslayer unconscious of or forgetful of his rights and of his opportunities. Could he now have seen any probable opening for an escape? The attempt would not have been delayed a minute. But the case seemed desperate, and he, he was aware of the line of sentinels and felt the difficulty of breaking through it unharmed. The lake offered no advantages. Oh, hang on, I lost my place. The lake offered no advantages, as the canoe would have given his foes the greatest facilities for overtaking him. 
else would he have found it no difficult task to swim as far as the castle. As he walked about the point, he even examined the spot to ascertain if it offered no other, no place of concealment, but its openness, its size, and the hundred watchful glances that were turned towards him, even while those who made them affected not to see him prevented any such expedient from succeeding. The dread and disgrace of failure had no influence on Deerslayer, who deemed it even a point of honor to re to reason and feel like a white man rather than as an rather than as an Indian, who felt it a sort of duty to do all he could that did not involve a dereliction from principle in order to save his life. Still, he hesitated the, about making the effort, for he also felt that he ought to see the chance of success before he committed himself. So he's looking around, looking for a way to break through, but um, he just doesn't see one. Now, this castle he talks about, is like on a little island out in this lake, and it's like a fort. Um, I don't know whether it's, oh gosh, I can't remember if it's a Delaware hold or a white man hold or whatever, but it is some fort out on the lake. In the meantime, the business of the camp appeared to proceed its, in its regular train. The chiefs consulted apart, admitting no one but the sumac to their councils, for she, the widow of the fallen warrior, had an exclusive right to be heard on such an occasion. The young men strolled about in indolent listlessness, awaiting the result with Indian patience, while the females prepared the feast that was to celebrate the termination of the affair, whether it proved fortunate or otherwise for our hero. No one betrayed feeling, and an indifferent observer beyond the extreme watchfulness of the sentinels would have detected no extraordinary movement or sensation to denote the real state of things. Two or three old women put their heads together, and it appeared unfavorably to the prospects of Deerslayer by their scowling looks and angry gestures. But a group of Indian girls were evidently animated by a different impulse, as was apparent by stolen glances that expressed pity and regret. In this condition of the camp, an hour soon glided away. Suspense is perhaps the feeling of all others that is most difficult to be supported. When Deerslayer landed, he fully expected in the course of a few minutes to drop to undergo the tortures of an Indian revenge, and he was prepared to meet his fate manfully. But the delay proved far more trying than the nearer approach of suffering, and the intended victim began seriously to meditate some desperate effort, effort at escape as it might be from the sheer anxiety to terminate the scene, when he was suddenly summoned to appear once more in front of his judges, who had already arranged the band in its former order, in readiness to receive him. Killer of the deer, commenced Rivenoak, as soon as his captive stood before him. My aged men have listened to wise words. They are ready to speak. You are a man whose fathers came from beyond the rising sun. We are children of the setting sun. We turn our faces towards the great sweet lakes when we look towards our villages. It may be a wide country and full of riches towards the morning, but it is very pleasant towards the evening. We love most to look in that direction. When we gaze at the east, we feel afraid. Canoe after canoe bringing more and more of your people in the track of the sun as if their land was so full as to run over. The red men are all few already. They have need of help. One of our best lodges has lately been emptied by the death of its master. It will be a long time before his son can grow big enough to sit in his place. There is his widow. She will want venison to feed her and her children, for her sons are yet like the young of the robin before they quit the nest. By your hand has this great calamity befallen her. She has two duties, one to the loop servier and one to his children. Scalp for scalp, life for life blood for blood is one law, to feed her young another. We know you, killer of the deer. You are honest when you say a thing. It is so. You have but one tongue, and that is not forked like a snake's. Your head is never hid in the grass. All can see it. What you say, that you will do. That will you do. You are just. When you have done wrong, it is your wish to do right again as soon as you can. Here is the sumac. She is alone in her wigwam, with her children crying around her for food. Yonder is a rifle. It is loaded and ready to be fired. Take the gun, go forth, and shoot a deer. Bring the venison and lay it before the widow of Le Loup Servier. Feed her children. Call her yourself her husband. 
after which your heart will no longer be Delaware, but Huron. Lusumac's ears will not hear the cries of her children. My people will count the proper number of warriors. So they're offering a chance for life. Now here's really important. All of this stuff right here um, kind of tells you how the Native Americans were feeling of uh, the coming of the white man. So they're happy when they turn their faces um, toward evening, which is sunset. So when they look west, because the white man's not there. But when they look east in the direction of morning, that's when they're afraid because they see canoe after canoe, ship after ship, bringing more and more white men. And it's like, it's like the cup of land is running over. So all these white men are coming into Native American land and taking their land. But Natty Bumpo, as they say, he is very honorable. He's very honest. He's very courageous. And they want to keep him alive and allow him to marry Laloupe Servier um, and feed her children. So he will take the place of Laloupe Servier, the man that he shot. I feared this, Reuven Oak answered Deerslayer when the other had ceased speaking. Yes, I did dread that it would come to this. Howsoever, the truth is soon told, and that will put an end to all expect expectations on this head. Mingo, I'm white and Christian born. Twould, twould ill become me to take a wife under red skin's form, under red skin forms from among heathen. That which I wouldn't do in peaceable terms and under a bright sun, still less would I do behind clouds in order to save my life. I may never marry. Most likely providence in putting me he up here in the woods has intended I should live single and without a lodge of my own. But should such a thing come to pass, none but a woman of my own color and gifts shall darken the door of my wigwam. As for feeding of the young of your dread, dead warrior, I would do that cheerfully. Could it be done without discredit? But it cannot, seeing that I can never live in a Huron village. Your own men must find the sumac in venison, and the next time she marries, let her hu take a husband whose legs are not long enough to overrun territory that don't belong to him. We fought a fair battle, and he fell. And in, in this there is nothing but what a brave expects, and should be ready to meet. As for getting a mingo heart, as well might you expect to see gray hairs on a boy or the blackberry growing on the pine. No, no, Euron, my gifts are white so far as wives are concerned. It is a Delaware and all things touching Indian engines. These words were scarcely out of the mouth of Deerslayer before a common murmur betrayed the dissatisfaction with which they had been heard. The aged women in particular were loud in their expressions of disgust. And the gentle Sumac herself, a woman quite old enough to be our hero's mother, was not in the least pacific in her denunciations. But all the other manifestations of disappointment and discontent were thrown into the background. By the fierce resentment of the panther, this grim chief had thought it a degradation to permit his sister to become the wife of a pale face of the Yengeese at all, and had only given a reluctant consent to the arrangement. One by no means unusual among the Indians, however at the earnest solicitations of the bereaved widow, and it goaded him to the quick to find his condescension slighted. The honor he had with so much regret been persuaded to accord condemned. The animal from which he got his name does not glare on his intended prey with more frightful ferocity than the eyes gleamed on the captive, nor was his arm backward in seconding the fierce resentment that almost consumed his breast. So here's the panther. Deerslayer has just rejected the panther's sister. The panther didn't want Deerslayer to live and only accepted it. All right, all right, if it means my sister and her children are going to be fed. But now the Deerslayer said, nope, I'm not marrying her. Oh, panther is ticked. Give me a second. Okay. Dog of the pale faces, exclaimed the Iroquois. He exclaimed in, in Iroquois, go yell among the curs of your own evil hunting grounds. The denunciation was accompanied by an appropriate action. Even while speaking, his arm was lifted and the tomahawk curled. Luckily, the loud tones of the speaker had drawn the eye of Deerslayer towards him. Else would that moment have probably closed his career. 
So great was the dexterity with which, with which this dangerous weapon was thrown, and so deadly the intent that it would have riven the skull of the prisoner had he not stretched forth an arm and caught the hand, caught the handle in one of its turns, with a readiness quite as remarkable as the skill with which the missile had been hurled. The projectile force was so great, notwithstanding, that when Deerslayer's arm was arrested, his hand was raised above and behind his own head in, in the very attitude necessary to return the attack. It is not certain whether the circumstance of finding himself unexpectedly in this menacing posture and armed tempted the young man to retaliate, or whether sudden resentment overcame his forbearance and prudence. His eye kindled, however, and a small red spot appeared on each cheek while he cast all his energy into the effort of his arm and threw back the weapon at his assailant. So Natty Bumpo, the panther throws this tomahawk. Natty Bumpo catches it above his head in one of the turns, has it just right to throw it back, and he does. The unexpectedness of this blow contributed to its success. The panther neither raising an arm nor bending his head to avoid it, the keen little axe struck the victim in a perpendicular line with the nose directly between the eyes. Man, literally braining him on the spot. Sallying forward as the serpent darts at his enemy even while receiving its own death wound, this man of powerful frame fell his length into the open area formed by the circle quavering in death. A common rush to his relief left the captive in a single instant quite without the crowd, and willing to make one desperate effort for life, he bounded off with the activity of a deer. There was but a breathless, breathless instant when the whole band, old and young, women and children, abandoning the lifeless body of the panther where it lay, raised the yell of alarm and followed in pursuit. Sudden as it had been, sudden, at, sudden as had been the event which induced Deerslayer to make this desperate trial of speed, his mind was not wholly unprepared for the fearful emergency. In the course of the past hour, he had pondered well on the chances of such an experiment and had shrewdly calculated all the details of success and failure. At the first leap, therefore, his body was completely under the direction of an in intelligence that turned all its efforts to the best account and prevented everything like hesitation or indecision at the important instant at, of the start. To this alone he was indebted for the first great advantage, that of getting through the line of sentinels unharmed. The manner in which this was done, though sufficiently simple, merits a description. Although the shores of the point were not infringed with bushes, as was the case of most of the others on the lake, it was owing altogether to the circumstance that the spot had been so much used by hunters and fishermen. This fringe commenced on what might be termed the main land and was as dense as usual, extending in long lines both north and south. In the latter direction, then, Deerslayer held his way, and as the sentinels were a little without the commencement of this thicket, before the alarm was clearly communicated to them, the fugitive had gained its cover. To run among the bushes, however, was out of the question, and Deerslayer held his way some forty or fifty yards in the water, which was barely knee-deep, offering as great an obstacle to the speed of his pursuers as it did to his own. As soon as a favorable spot presented, he darted through the line of bushes and into the open woods. Several rifles, rifles were discharged at Deerslayer while in the water, and more followed when he, came out, when he came out into the comparative exposure of the clear forest. But the direction of his line of flight, which partially crossed that, uh, uh, that of the fire, the haste with which the weapons had been aimed, and in general confusion that prevailed in the camp, prevented... Um, I lost my place. I just did that. But the direction of his line of flight, which partially crossed that of the fire, the haste with which the weapons had been aimed, and the general confusion that prevailed in the camp prevented any harm from being done. Bullets whistled past him, and many cut twigs from the branches at his side but not one touched even his dress. The delay caused by these fruitless attempts was of great service to the fugitive, who had gained more than a hundred yards on even the leading men of the Hurons, ere something like concert and order had entered into the chase. To think of, the, of following with rifles in hand was out of the question, and after emptying their pieces in vague hopes of wounding their captive, the best runners of the Indians threw them aside, 
calling out to the women and boys to recover and load them again as soon as possible. So what he's saying is um, like this concert and order, like the best Hurons, the leading men are now in, in, in hot pursuit. And it's just like their order, they're chasing him almost in order of their leadership. So they're stopping to fire at him, which is actually giving Natty more time to get away. Deerslayer knew too well the desperate nature of the struggle in which he was engaged to lose one of the precious moments. He also knew that his only hope was to run in a straight line, for as soon as he began to turn or double, the greater number of his pursuers would escape out of the question, would put escape out of the question. There we go. He held his way, therefore, in a diagonal direction up the acclivity, which was neither very high nor very steep in this part of the mountain, but which was sufficiently toilsome for one contending for life to render it painfully oppressive. There, however, he slackened his speed to recover breath, and proceeding even at a quick walk or slow trot along the more difficult parts of the way. The Hurons were whooping and leaping behind him, but this he disregarded, well knowing they must overcome the difficulties he had surmounted ere they could reach the elevation to which he had attained. The summit of the first hill was now quite near him, and he saw by the formation of the land that a deep glen intervened before the base of the second hill could be reached. Walking deliberately to the summit, he glanced eagerly about him in every direction in quest of a cover. None offered in the ground, but a fallen tree lay near him, and desperate circumstances required desperate rem remedies. This tree lay in a line parallel to the glen, at the brow of the hill. To leap on it, and then to force his person as close as possible under its lower side, took but a moment. Previously to disappearing from his pursuers, however, Deerslayer stood on the height and gave a cry of triumph, as if, as if exulting at the sight of the dis descent that lay before him. In the next instant, he was stretched beneath the tree. Okay, so he jumps up on this tree log that's laying parallel to where he's running, and he gives this cry of triumph, and then he lays down under the tree, under the, the log that's laying there, kind of underneath it as he's going down the hill, or as it's going down the hill. No sooner was this expedient adopted than the young man ascertained how desperate had been his own efforts by the violence and pulsations in his frame. He could hear his heart beat, and his breathing was like the action of a bellows in quick motion. Breathing was gained, however, and the heart soon ceased to throb as if about to break through its confinement. The footsteps of those who toiled up the opposite side of the acclivity were now audible, and presently voices and treads announced the arrival of the pursuers. The foremost shadow shouted as they reached the height. Then, fearful that the enemy, their enemy would escape under favor of the descent, each feared upon the fallen tree and plunged into the ravine, trusting to get sight of the pursued ere he reached the bottom. In this manner, Huron followed Huron until Natty began to ask. Others succeeded, however, until quite forty had leaped over the tree, and then he counted them as the surest mode of ascertaining how many could be behind. Presently, all were in the bottom of the glen, quite a hundred feet below him, and some had even ascended part of the opposite hill when it became evident and the inquiry was making as to the direction he had taken. This was the critical moment, and one of nerves less steady or of, tra of, or of a training that had been neglected would have seized it to rise and fly. Not so with Deerslayer. He lay quiet, watching with jealous vigilance every movement below and fast regaining his breath. The Hurons now resembled a pack of hounds at fault. Little was said, but each man ran about examining the dead leaves as the hound hunts for the lost scent. The great number of moccasins that had passed made the examination difficult. Though, in, though the in toe of an Indian was easily to be distinguished from the freer and wider step of a white man. Believing that no more pursuers remained behind and hoping to steal away unseen, Deerslayer suddenly threw himself over the tree and fell upon the upper side. This achievement appeared to be effected successfully, and hope beat high in the bosom of the fugitive. Rising to his hands and feet, after a moment, lost in listening to the sound in the glen in order to ascertain if he had been seen, the young man scrambled to the top of the hill, a distance of only ten yards, in the expectation of getting its brow between him and his pursuers, and himself so far under cover. 
Even this was affected, and he rose to his feet, walking swiftly but steadily among the summit in the direction opposite to which he had first fled. The nature of the calls in the glen, however, soon made him uneasy, and he sprang upon the summit again in order to reconnoiter. No sooner did he reach the height than he was seen, and the chase renewed. As it was better footing on the level ground, Deerslayer now avoided the side hill, avoiding his flight along the ridge. While the Hurons, judging from the general formation of the land, saw that the ridge would soon melt into the hollow and kept to the latter as the easiest mode of heading the, fug of heading the fugitive. A few of the same time, a few at the same time turned south with a view to prevent his escaping in that direction, while some crossed his trail towards the water in order to prevent his retreat by lake, running southerly. The situation of Deerslayer was now more critical than it had ever, ever had been. He was virtually surrounded on three sides, having the lake on the north, on the fourth, but he pondered well on all the chances and took his measure with coolness, even while at the top of his speed. As is generally the case with the vigorous border men, he could outrun any single Indian among his pursuers who were principally formidable to him on account of their numbers and the advantages they possessed in position, and he would not have hesitated to break off in a straight line at any spot could he have got the whole band again fairly behind him. But no such chance did, or indeed could now offer. And when he found that he was descending towards the glen by the melting away of the ridge, he turned short at right angles to his previous course and went down the declivity with tremendous velocity, holding his way towards the shore. Some of his pursuers came panting up the hill in direct chase, while most still kept on the ravine, intending to head him at its termination. Deerslayer had now a different, though death, a desperate project in view, Abandoning all thoughts, uh, thought of escape by the woods, he made the best of his way towards the canoe. He knew where it lay. Could it be reached, he had only to run the gauntlet of a few rifles, and success would be certain. None of the warriors had kept their weapons, which would have retarded their speed, and the risk would come either from the uncertain hands of the women or from those of some well-grown boy, though most of the latter were already out in, the hot, in hot pursuit. Everything seemed pro propitious to the execution of this plan, and the course being continued and the course being a continued descent. The young man went over the ground at a rate that promised a speedy termination to his toil. As Deerslayer approached the point, several women and children were passed by or passed, but Though the former endeavored to cast dried branches between his legs, the terror inspired by his bold retaliation on the redoubled panther was so great that none dared come near enough seriously to molest him. He went by all triumphantly and reached, reached the fringe of bushes. Plunging through these, our hero found himself once more in the lake and within fifty feet of the canoe. Here he ceased to run, for he well understood that his breath was now all important to him. He even stopped as he advanced and cooled his parched mouth by scooping water up in his hand to drink. Still the moments pressed, and he soon stood at the side of the canoe. The first glance told him that the paddles had been removed. This was a sore disappointment after all his efforts, and for a single moment he thought of turning and facing his foes by walking with dignity into the center of camp, the camp again. But in an infernal yell such as the American savage alone can raise, proclaim the quick approach of the nearest of his pursuers, and the in instinct of life triumphed. Preparing himself duly and giving the, a right direction to its bows, he ran off into the water, bearing the canoe before him, threw all his strength and skill into a last effort, and cast himself forward so as to fall into the bottom of the light craft without materially impeding its way. Here he remained on his back, both to regain his breath and to cover his person from the deadly fight rifle. The lightness, which was such an advantage in paddling the canoe, now operated unfavorably. Material was so like, like a feather that the boat had no momentum, else would the impulse in that smooth and placid sheet have impelled it to a distance from the shore that could have rendered paddling with his hands safe. Could such a point once be reached, Deerslayer thought he might get far enough out to attract the attention of the Chingachuk and Judith, 
who would not fail to come to his relief with other canoes, a circumstance that promised everything. As the young men lay in the bottom of the canoe, he watched its movements by studying the tops of the trees on the mountainside and judged by a, his distance by the time and motions. Voices on the shore were now numerous, and he heard something said about manning the raft, which, unfort which fortunately for the fugitive lay at a considerable distance on the other side of the point. Perhaps the situation of Deerslayer had not been more critical that day than it was at this moment. It certainly had not been one half as tantalizing. He lay perfectly quiet for two or three minutes, trusting to the single sense of hearing, confident that the noise in the lake would reach his ears, did anyone venture to approach by swimming. Once or twice he fancied that the element was stirred by the cautious movement of an arm, and then he perceived it was the wash of the water on the pebbles of the strand. For in mimicry of the ocean, it is seldom that those little lakes are so totally tranquil as not to possess a slight heaving and setting on their shores. Suddenly, all the voices ceased, and a death-like stillness pervaded the spot. A quietness as profound as if all lay in the repose of inanimate life. By this time, the canoe had drifted so far as to render nothing visible to Deerslayer. As he lay on his back, except the blue void of space, and a few of those brighter rays that proceed from the effulgence of the sun marking his proximity. It was not possible to endure this uncertainty long. The young man well knew that the profound stillness foreboded evil, the savages never being so silent as when they are about to strike a blow, resembling the stealthy foot of the panther ere he takes his leap. He took out his knife and was about to cut a hole through the bark in order to get a view of the shore when he paused from a dread of being seen in the operation which would direct the enemy where to aim their bullets. At this instant, a rifle fired, and the ball pierced both sides of the canoe within 18 inches of the spot where his head lay. This was close work, but our hero had too lately gone through that which was closer to be appalled. He lay still half a minute longer, and then he saw the summit of an oak coming slowly within the narrow horizon. Unable to account for this change, Deerslayer could restrain his impatience no longer. Hitching his body along with the utmost caution, he got his eye at the bullet hole and fortunately commanded a very tolerable view of the point. The canoe, by one of those imperceptible impulses that so often decide the fate of men as well as the course of things, had inclined southerly and was drifting, slowly drifting down the lake. It was lucky that Deerslayer had given it a shove sufficiently vigorous to send it past the end of the point ere it took this inclination, or it must have gone ashore again. As it was, it drifted so near as to bring the tops of two or three trees within the range of the young man's view, as had been mentioned, and indeed to come in quite as close as come in quite as close proximity with the extremity of the point as was all this, as was at all safe. The distance could not much have exceeded a hundred feet, though fortunately a light current of air from the southwest began to set it slowly offshore. Deerslayer now felt the urgent necessity of resorting to some expedient to get farther from his foes and, if possible, to apprise his friends of his situation. The distance rendered the last difficult, while the proximity to the point rendered the first indispensable. As was you uh, usual in such craft, a large round smooth stone was in each end of the canoe for the double purpose of seats and ballast. One of these was within reach of his feet. The stone he contrived to get so far between his legs as to reach it with his hands, and then he managed to roll it to the side of, of its fellow in the bows, where, he, where the two served to keep the trim of the light boat while he worked his own body as far as aft as possible before quitting the shore. And as soon as he perceived that the paddles were gone, Deerslayer had thrown in a bit of dead branch into the canoe, and this was within reach of his arm. How lucky! that he grabbed a branch while he was running when he realized that the, the oars were gone and then he has this dead branch in there. Everything seems to work out for Natty Bumpo. Removing the cap he wore, he put it on the end of his, this stick and just let it appear over the edge of the canoe as far as possible from his own person. The ruse was scarcely adopted before the young man had a proof how much he had underrated the intelligence of his enemies. In contempt of an artifice so shallow and commonplace, a bullet was fired directly through another part of the canoe, which actually raised his skin. 
He dropped the cap and instantly raised it immediately over his head as a safeguard. It would be, it would seem that the second artifice was unseen or what was more probable, the Hurons feeling certain of recovering their captive wished to take him alive. Okay. So he tries to, to like fake them out. So he's laying in the bottom of this canoe and he holds up his cap um, on the branch and the Hurons, they knew. So they fired where his body was. So he's not really sure at this point, are they trying to take him alive or are they trying to kill him? He's still not really sure. Deerslayer lay passive a minute, a few minutes longer, his eye at the bullet hole, however, and much did he rejoice at seeing that he was drifting gradually farther and farther from the shore. When he looked upward, the treetops had disappeared, but he soon found that the canoe was slowly turning so as to prevent his getting a view of anything at his peephole, but two of the but of the two extremities of the lake. He now bethought him of the stick, which was crooked and offered some facilities for rowing without the necessity of rising. The experiment succeeded on trial even better, um, better even than he had hoped, though this great embarrassment was to keep the canoe straight. But his present maneuver was seen soon, beca- was seen, soon became apparent by the clamor on the shore, and a bullet entering the stern of the canoe traversed its length whistling between the arms of our hero and passed out at the head. This satisfied the fugitive that he was getting away with tolerable speed and induced him to increase his efforts. He was making a stronger push than common when another messenger from the point broke the stick outboard and at once deprived him of his oar. So they're still shooting at him, but he knows he's getting away. And then they just broke the branch with a bullet. As the sound of voices seemed to grow more and more distant, however, Deerslayer determined to leave all to the drift until he believed himself beyond the reach of bullets. This was nervous work, but it was the wisest of all the expedients that had uh, that offered, and the young man was encouraged to persevere in it by the circumstance that he felt his face fanned by the air, a proof that there was a little more wind. Whew, that was a long reading. So anyway, what did it take me? About 40 minutes. So about a class period to read. So um, you have these questions. Make sure you ask. This is a pretty difficult story just because it's written so long ago. I mean, it was difficult to read. So I'm sure I butchered part of it. But anyway, good luck with this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I really like this story. I really, I've always wanted to read The Leather Shocking Tales. I've just never done it yet. So anyway, 